Bonjour, everyone. Uh, my French is a little rusty, but I will try my best to communicate with you all. Um, so today in this session, we're going to be looking at bypassing next generation 2FA and MFA implementations. But, you know, since we're, since we're only at, um, you know, 25 minute mark, I'll do my best to, to, to move forward as quickly as possible. Here's a little bit introduction about me. I'm Shamir. Um, uh, recently, I was ranked as the third most accomplished bug bounty hunter in the world. I run three companies. Uh, I've written a book called Bug Bounty Hunting Essentials. Um, and uh, my core expertise is web application security, IoT security, and wireless security. Um, and I'm doing my PhD in applied blockchain. So here's the agenda. We're going to try our best to follow it um, to the best of our extent. We're going to look at 2FA, how it evolved. We're going to look at implementation of 2FA and MFA. We're going to look at you know, bypassing 2FA in web and mobile apps. Um, we're going to look at bypassing MFA. And then we're going to look at bypassing biometrics. Um, so yeah, there's a disclaimer. This, you know, don't go. Obviously, you're going to go uh, home and try this out, but don't go trying it out without anyone's permission. Okay, 2FA. Now, we all know what 2FA is, right? It is, um, it is a mechanism of verifying a person using an additional security measure, which is mostly a one-time passcode. Because 2FA was not enough when we were initially uh, piling up for more and more information, we evolved it into MFA. Now, MFA is multi-factor. It goes beyond. It involves biometrics, involves face print or voice print, or a rotating key on a specific hardware device. Now, this is a working architecture of 2FA. We have the app that authenticates. We have the login mechanism. Uh, we have the OTP generation. And we have the OTP delivery. OK, now these are some of the common methods that you see out there. These are some of the common methods that you see out there using which 2FAs are implemented. We have SMS. We have time-based. Um, uh, we have uh, push notifications. We have uh, um, challenge and responses. We have emails. We have FIDO. Um, we have um, you know, biometrics and all these kinds of measures. Now, over the course of my career, over the course of my career, I have been able to identify multiple methods to bypass 2FA and MFA. And they all can be boiled down into these 10 different methods. We have brute force. We have broken session management. We have CSRF, code reusability. We have request methods. Um, we have a response code manipulation. We have input parameter manipulation. We have 2FA code leakage. We have OAuth bypasses, random back backup codes, and forced browsing. Now, these are the tools that you're going to need you know, while testing for any web application vulnerability. These are the tools that you're going to need. Let's look at brute force specifically and, it by, and its bypasses. Brute force is, you know, nowadays it's a simple dictionary attack, right? We use it and we know that conventionally, eventually, we're going to reach a common password or a known uh, URL or an ID, which we can use to bypass the 2FA mechanism. But there are multiple bypasses involved in 2FA. We can use 2FA. Uh, uh, we can bypass 2FA using different brute force mechanisms um, uh, that are available on the web. Now, what I'm going to show you in all of these methods are the methods that I have used or other researchers have used in their own implementations so that you know that they're live. Okay, so this is th there is an app called Grab, which is um, Asia's number one um, ride-hailing app. We were able to bypass 2FA using a simple brute force attack using Burp. Now, what happened was the, their API call request for 2FA was in a parameter 
called profile activation code, which was a four digit code. And there was no rate limitation on it. As you can see here, there was no rate limitation on that code. And we were able to bypass 2FA using it. How? We all know Burp Suite. We've all used Burp Suite's Intruder tool. And we were able to basically differentiate between the content length of a valid 2FA code and an invalid 2FA code. And this is how we bypassed it. In all of our companies, we use Slack. In Slack, we were able to successfully bypass the 2FA code using the password request option. Now, the problem was that Slack was implementing the 2FA brute force protection on the login panel, but there was no brute force protection on the 2FA panel after the password reset request. So that's how we bypassed it. Ironically, the next one, which I'm going to demonstrate to you, is Dashlane. <laughs> Dashlane is a password vault. What's ironic about this is this particular application is used to secure your passwords, right? But that didn't happen. What happened was if we added the X forwarded four, uh, sorry, X forwarded four header in the Dashlane URLs and basically routed it to our own localhost address, we were able to bypass 2FA using it. As you can see right here. Okay, next is a big one, Microsoft. Microsoft implemented rate limitation on its 2FA using something called IP blacklisting. So if you send three requests from the same IP address, Microsoft blacklisted your IP address. This was, um, this was a collaboration between myself and a researcher called ZeroHack, and this is how we did it. So we identified that if we sent requests within gaps of timelines or within different intervals of timelines, we would, we would get locked out. But if we sent concurrent requests at the same time, we would not get locked out. But the problem was that Microsoft was Im implementing at that point in time an alphanumeric code with a six digit um, length and we had to brute force 11 million possibilities. Now what we found out was that after every 15 requests, Microsoft would blacklist your IP address. So here's how we did it. We collected a list of fake IP addresses. They were not real. And that was the problem in Microsoft's implementation, that they were not validating if the IP addresses were even real. We collected that list, and we bombarded 11 million request attempts at the same time. And we were then able to successfully bypass Microsoft's 2FA. Yeah, this was, this was uh, you know, quite interesting as well. Just one minute. Yeah, next we're going to look at um, the 2FA bypasses uh, using session management. Broken session management is something that we face every day. It, it's basically a flaw in a web application's architecture where your session management does not work. And let's start with Facebook. Facebook has a donate option. And that donate option basically considered, has a nonce parameter or a UID and a UID parameter. A nonce parameter in this case is basically a cookie. And a UID is your account user ID. If you gave your donate link to someone else, they would be logged into your account using your own credentials without ever having to enter the 2FA code. This is how simple it was to bypass 2FA in Facebook. I'm sure you guys have heard of Mapbox, right? No? Anyone heard of Mapbox here? It is the second most used uh, mapping API in the world. And there was a password reset session flaw within the 2FA mechanism, which means 
If you reset it a password in Mapbox, it would directly log you into your account without ever having to ask the 2FA uh, code. Now, these are simple mechanisms. These are very simple mechanisms that we have for bypassing 2FA. Let's look at Instagram. This was very interesting. Be and, and it was specifically related to two users interoperably working, um, uh, interoperably working for, an, uh, for a locked out account. And this is how it worked. So we had two users. User, a, user B logs into user A's account. In this case, user B is the attacker and user B is the uh, user B is the attacker and user A is the victim. Now what happened was user B has act, user B has changed the email address of user A. And when he clicks the email address into his own account, actually I have a video for it. Let me show you that. Second, okay, yeah, it's working. So, this is the attacker's account, and as you can see, that there are two accounts here user A's, user B's is the attacker, and user A is the victim. User B changes the attacker's email address, and user A um, gets a notification that their email address has been changed. Now what happens inside is the link that is received by user B on the user B's email, it is not validated for a 2FA code itself. It does not have any validation in terms of logging the user in, in terms of a 2FA, 2FA itself. So this means that Instagram was not actually validating uh, the 2FA codes when it came to the email change. Now the problem is that these are all implementation flaws that are intrinsically present in the application itself. It is dependent how we code the application when, if, if and when and how we want to protect our applications from these kinds of threats and flaws. Let's move ahead. CSRF, cross-site request forgery. We all know this vulnerability. We've been working on it for a long time in terms of OWASP. It is an act where you can basically force a user to click or browse on a link and then have them perform an action. There's a company called MailRU. They have a subsidiary site called PandaRU. Now, there was a CSRF vulnerability in PandaRU that basically allowed a user to disable a, an attacker's 2FA, to a victim's 2FA, sorry. So if you would make someone click on a web form specifically crafted for the 2FA account, their entire 2FA would be disabled and then you can log in very easily. Moving ahead, code reusability. Now you would be surprised how many web and mobile applications have these vulnerabilities present where you can simply use a code. This is a company called Automatic, which is a WordPress owned company and we were able to bypass 2FA in Automatic using old 2FA codes, which means that over the course of 24 hours, there would be a number of codes that I would receive and I would use any one of them to bypass the 2FA. And then there's another one, the 2FA code leakage. This is basically a technique that attackers, that, that is present in which the 2FA code is being leaked either in the internal files or the application's responses. And this is conventionally present as well. Now, as you can see here, the above is the request and the below is the response. So the application did actually send the 2FA code as a response to the request in order to be stored in the HTML files, which means that the application locally stored the 2FA code 
so that it can be compared by the user. We have something else called um, bypassing 2FA using secret key disclosure. Secret key is basically a key that is, um, that is in a conventional sense, when you, when you attach a 2FA device to your account, what's hap what happens is you have to scan a QR code in order to attach that particular device, right? That QR code basically is the secret key. And this was a very interesting vulnerability where we were able to actually find the secret key within one of the source codes of the application. This was in a mobile application, by the way. And as you can see right here, that we were able to basically acquire the secret key. What we did was we acquired the secret key, we created a QR code using the key, we scanned the QR code using the victim's account, and we were able to connect our own device to that particular account, totally bypassing 2FA without even having uh, the victim know about it. Okay, input parameter poisoning. Now this is also very, very interesting um, in which it is a mechanism where you actually poison input parameters. Um, you manipulate them, you delete them, or you change them in a, way that, in a way that basically you tell the application that this input parameter is not as such it is. Now Glassdoor is, is, a, is a website, um, a hiring site, right? We were able to bypass 2FA using null characters in Glassdoor. So if you can see what, uh, what's on the screen right now, we would log into the application, we would enable the 2FA, we would log out, and then we would log in again. And when we were asked for the 2FA OTP code in the post request, we would pass on null characters. And that would tell the application that this is a valid response and then it would just let us go in. Ironically, there was a vulnerability in PayPal as well, which allowed us to bypass 2FA, which was very interesting. Because this is an input parameter manipulation, this is how it happened. This was basically in the question and answer field of PayPal, where you would, where you would go to reset your 2FA code in a try another way option. What happened was, when it asked you for a question and when it asked you for an answer, you could just intercept that request and you could delete that, those challenge and response fields and that would manipulate the application into thinking that the, uh, that the response and requests are actually valid. And now we, ha we manipulated requests, now we're gonna manipulate responses. There are multiple ways to manipulate responses. We have the response codes, we have the response bodies, we have, you know, a lot of these things that are, um, you know, that, that, that are present in a response of an application's request. The simplest way to bypass a 2FA using response code manipulation is to just turn the status from false to true. And trust me, 60% of the times, the application that are using authorization bearers actually have this vulnerability present in them. So what you would do is you would intercept a request uh, in whose 2FA response is invalid or false, and you would change that into true. And basically, it would allow you to go inside. Here's another classic example of uh, how you can bypass 2FA. It's basically checking if the, res uh, checking if the response was in uh, terms of the login request. Basically, the website is using an authorization token in its request, and this token is only provided when the, when, when the user's 2FA gets completed. And this is how it works. In the simplest of terms, if you give the application an authorization bearer or an authorization token in response to the request, it has to bypass 2FA. 
it has to bypass 2FA. And this is what ha what's happening here. This is what you see a conventional response to a request of an application. And this is what you see a, a changed response where you're actually manipulating the response body. And what we have next here, this is a very, very interesting, um, interesting scenario where we were able to bypass 2FA in an e-wallet system where we were able to bypass three layers of 2FA. Now, how this worked is they were leaking their encryption key into the Android app. Now, they were encrypting the responses, but they were actually leaking their encryption key in the Android app itself, which you can see right here. Okay. Now this is going to take a while, so I want you to really look at it. We have something called the CNIC, which is the National Identification Number. Now this particular application was using the CNIC as well as the phone number to be as a to to be used as an authentication mechanism, and then it would send you the OTP on your phone. And all of the requests and all of the responses would be 100% encrypted, but the problem was that they were leaking the encryption key within the application's response body and uh, within the application source code, I'm sorry. And since, uh, since we had access to the AES encryption key, we would then encrypt our own responses. Now, paying attention to this particular scenario, how would this go about? I, as a legitimate user, can sign up on the application, and I, as a legitimate user, can identify what is a valid response. What is a valid response to a particular request? Now, I know from here that I don't have access to the OTP or the 2FA code. I don't have access to that, um, uh, the OTP or the 2FA code entirely. And uh, since I don't have access to that, how am I going to have uh, how every time that I log in using an OTP would be an invalid response. Now, all we have to do was capture those invalid responses, decrypt them, and then encrypt them with the user's ID having a valid response. That is all that we had to do in this case scenario. And this is how we were able to successfully bypass 2FA for an application with 15 million users in Asia. And that application is, you know, what you see in front of you. So this is how it happened. As you can see, we have submitted the request and, uh, yep, we have submitted the request and what's happening here is this is the, res th this is the request. We're going we're gonna to send it out. It is invalid. And then we copy this request in order to intercept the response we forwarded. This is the response. Now we're going to replace that response with our own. And as you can see that it's successful. Now we're going to do that for all of the other 2FA mechanisms implemented in this particular app. And this is a financial application just like Coinbase and just like Robinhood, but with some less users. And we were able to bypass 2FA specifically for it just because of one problem that they were leaking their AES encryption key within the source code. Oh, this is a, this is a, a nice one as well. It's, it's, this was a, a 2FA bypass by a researcher called uh, Ivan Rickefort. I worked with him and this particular 2FA bypass. Yeah, Shapeshift.io. Shapeshift is basically uh, a website that allows you to change or exchange cryptocurrency. Change or exchange cryptocurrency. And uh, what we basically did was we were easily able to bypass 2FA by manipulating the response code entirely. And that's how we were able to log into the application and conventionally bypass 2FA here. 
we're going to run through this um, a bit quickly because I know we're almost out of time. Random backup codes. Now this is a mechanism which is used to reset your 2FA when you have uh, lost, your, uh, lost access to your device, right? And that is using backup codes. Now most of the time web applications do not have uh, proper validation steps in place to verify those backup codes. And this is what happens, um, uh, you know, when, when this vulnerability exists. What we had was, after enabling 2FA, we got uh, access to some backup codes, and we note down those backup codes. So after entering the email and password, there was an option to reset 2FA using those backup codes, right? But we just entered random jargon, like 000123, something like that. And using that, we were able to successfully bypass 2FA. And this has worked on 26% of the websites that we have actually used this technology on. Developers oftentimes add backup code uh, fields, do not implement proper mechanisms. Now we're jumping to the end of 2FA, request methods. Request methods are what? When, uh, when a client requests a server, it's get, head, put, post, patch, trace, options, and delete. Here's what happened. In one of the scenarios, we had an MFA, and um, we were able to bypass it or delete the complete MFA mechanism by simply using the delete option because the developers were not teching for it. We were able to totally manipulate the application into thinking that this is a legitimate user requesting you to disable the 2FA. Now, the, one of the easiest and one of the most found ways, actually not one of the, the most found methods to bypass 2FA and the easiest ones is always OAuth. OAuth is everywhere. Login with Google, login with Facebook, login with blah, 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 different kinds of websites. This is what ends up happening. There is no 2FA validation on 93% of OAuth implemented websites. There is no 2FA on there, which means that if you click on login with Facebook and login with Google, you will not be encountered a 2FA code parameter. Okay, this is an interesting one. It's called force browsing, and I believe this is the last method to bypass 2FA, and then we're going to jump into Android and iOS biometrics bypasses. This is something called force browsing, where you're actually browsing the application onto a URL that is not accessible without a session. And this was a vulnerability that we and me and the researchers at uh, Box identified. And I'm going to show you a video of it very shortly. So here's the thing. Um, a sample request looks like this. You're routed to the authenticator um, .aspx and you route the application to home.aspx. So basically, you're routing the application to a non-2FA URL. And this is how we bypass boxes 2FA. Uh, yeah. Let's jump straight to the video, guys. In this video, so, I'm going to how to uh, bypass so this is boxes to a fake code. Now what happened here was it was routing us to a t it was routing us to a 2FA page right here. And then what we did was we actually routed it to an MFA page instead of that particular 2FA page. And that particular MFA page did not have any validation of 2FA at all. Let's jump ahead please.
So yeah, this is the victim's machine. And you're asked to log in to Box using the username and password. And then you are prompted to, uh, you're landed on the 2FA page. In an ideal scenario, this is good. This should work, right? But in a non-ideal scenario, no. That is not what we do uh, as attackers. We're routing it. Let me just show you the flow chart so that you have an idea. Here, we're on the attacker's flow, we're actually routing the user onto an MFA page, and it is not validated properly, which means that we are, we are um, uh, you know, Box basically does not verify that the TOTP belongs to a victim, which means that out of all the TOTPs, it's not verifying anything at all. Okay, um, yeah, I think we're out of time, right? Yeah, I'm quite sorry because uh, actually we're out of schedule. No I would like to thank you very much for your conference. Please, applause uh, Shamir, who's with us today. I'm sorry that our short schedule doesn't allow for the questions and answers to be settled here, but we have the space here on the uh, international uh, cyber security forum to interact between you and your public. If you have some questions, please proceed with Shamir yeah, during guys, the, the fair. I'll be around. This is my email address and you can search, uh, on, you can search me on LinkedIn as well. Um, I have a I have consistent research on 2FA and MFA bypasses for the past uh, three years. And um, I'm also giving another live hack session on SCADA hacking at uh, 450. So please be sure to check it out. Thank you so much for your time.